Good afternoon. If you're on the East Coast, uh, good evening. If you are uh, in Europe, and welcome to another edition of CIONet Spotlight, where each week we take a high profile digital leader somewhere in the world and put them in the spotlight, as it were. Uh, today, I'm delighted to welcome Ty Hayes, who's the interim CIO of the city of Atlanta. Uh, prior to that, she was the chief technical officer of uh, CTO of the city of Atlanta. And what I really like, and I'm gonna enjoy talking about um, Ty in the next half an hour is um, part of her responsibility is uh, running technology for the world's largest airport. So she also, in her uh, remit as CIO, uh, looks after Atlanta, Hartsfield Jackson Airport, 110 million passengers a year. So we're gonna get to that as part of the conversation as well. I think that's really, really cool and uh, pretty, pretty big job. Um, in, in, in Ty's background, she's uh, had digital roles at GE, Lockheed, uh, Atlanta Public Schools, and also she's um, been part of a boutique uh, IT uh, uh, consultancy practice. Uh, that was a, a brief introduction, but uh, without further ado, Ty, maybe we'll start by you just uh, elaborating on your, own, on your own background. Just give us kind of a flavor of how you got to where you're at in your career. Sure. So thank you, first of all, Mark, for having me and, um, you know, being able to just sit down and chat with you for a second. Um, so um, I've been in, you know, technology for most of my professional career. Um, I did start um, my career in the Navy. So I am a Navy veteran. Um, and um, as part of that, um, I was selected to be an officer uh, with the Navy and uh, which led me back to Georgia um, to go to Georgia Tech to, to um, take my commission. Um, ended up not doing the commission um, and started working for Center for Disease Control and um, then GE afterwards. And, um, and, you know, actually my background wasn't, my college career wasn't really technology. It was industrial engineering and my master's is in the economics and strategy. So I do enjoy the business side of things. Um, but I just, you know, I don't know. I, I ended up on some technology projects and uh, then security seemed to be the lane that I was gonna um, really grow in. And, and a lot of that opportunity came about at Lockheed Martin Aeronautics um, where I led the um, IT security organization. Uh, we actually grew that organization from about eight people when I started to over 40 something when I, when I left. And um, just the traveling um, associated with that um, landed me back in Atlanta at Atlanta Public Schools. Um, I don't mind sharing as part of my story. Um, my son um, was dyslexic and I really wanted to understand, you know, what was going on with him and education was just becoming a passion as a mom, just learning around what was happening. And that's kind of how I ended up in some of the local government and education space. And um, I ended up at Atlanta, um, Mr. Brantley, who was the previous CIO, very good friend of mine, um, when he was... Um, appointed as a CIO, he tapped me. I was like, I need you to come over, you know, as a chief technology officer, your, your background in security and just after the cyber breach, you need you here, need you here. And um, I said no a few times. <laughs> and then he just was very persistent and um, ended, up, ended up here in Atlanta and um, we've been doing some amazing work. So I'm glad to be where I am today. That's great. Uh, help us understand you know, a lot of our listeners are CIOs from traditional industries, but you know when you're the CIO of a city, I know you 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 support the judicial department. You support, I mean, just just go through the different aspects you support. So I think it's quite interesting, and enlightening when you think of all the services in a in a city that you have to support. Absolutely. So um, you know, is is apparent, of course, the um, the police department, fire department. Um, I have public works, um, department of transportation, uh, which is responsible for all of our lighting and local street lights and so forth. Um, our watershed department is humongous um, with several different water plants and facilities. Um, we also have the local courts, um, um, circuit courts here. Um, and then of course, city council, and then all of the shared sort of services organizations that a lot of our my other peers may be very you know, familiar with, which is HR, finance, procurement. Um, and then of course the airport, um, which is um, 
just a task within itself. And I could not uh, have this kind of breadth of oversight without an amazing team. So we do have um, deputy CIOs who are aligned at um, a lot of the critical agencies. And then um, the CTO just kind of oversees all of the infrastructure and, and security or considered shared services for all those agencies. Got it. And in your, in your prior capacity as CTO, you had a lot of work, obviously, at the airport as well. That was pretty, must have been pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, all of the agencies, all this is the, um, the blessing and the curse. Um, all of the agencies have their own strategic uh, plans and um, areas of, uh, of development and growth. And so as a CTO, um, my job was to kind of align uh, with all of the agencies and look at where there were standard um, um, technologies and where we needed to streamline, except especially coming off of a cyber breach that we experienced in the city, introducing very strict standards, processes were, um, it was very important. And I will say that um, I think IT has gone from being seen as a support arm and, you know, just computers and the help desk to being a lot more collaborative in helping with solutioning and finding the right um, solutions for the city. I'm also responsible for smart cities, which is also looking at all of the innovation that is going on um, in the city of Atlanta as well. And, and that's we all city. those tendrils together. Right. And when we spoke the other day, that smart cities initiative, you're plugged into other cities globally and how they're doing. I know you had a recent trip uh, prior to COVID, but you went over to Barcelona yes. and it's kind of a showcase for smart cities and, and many other CIOs of large cities globally were there and you kind of interacted and maybe you can talk about that for a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, so yes, we we were able, we had um, uh, CIOs um, both from the United States, but also international. Um, I actually was able to share the stage with uh, um, technology leaders from Africa, from China, Japan, and, and we all are trying to tackle the same types of issues when we start to talk about innovation within city and how to optimize city infrastructure. Um, Atlanta becomes very unique uh, because we are very established already have a lot of um, foundational pieces that are harder to unravel opposed to if you were building from scratch right and so um, we looked at where um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of case studies and, and learning from others that have done it before me and then seeing how that fits to the problems that I'm trying to solve. And so we have formed some very long lasting relationships by, by that experience and we, we still collaborate often today. Wonderful. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that background. Let's, um, you know, this is not a COVID centric conversation, but it's certainly pivotal. We're coming up, you know, next month roughly on the one year anniversary of COVID in the US. Looking back a year, what, what really happened um, in Atlanta? You know, what happened with, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis your role, but clearly the airport got pretty quiet <laughs> in, in mid-March. Um, what happened to other services and just kind of frame, you know, kind of that journey of last year and how the city reacted. Obviously it was a big election year and then we ended the special election in January, which of course you guys, like, you. you Brief me, you stayed out of uh, as a CIO, but but what really happened with the airport first shutting down, and then as the year progressed, as you continue to provide those services, vital services, uh, emergency services to the you know to the uh, to the citizens. Sure. Um, so of course, safety was the first um, thing um, right out of the gate, and um, our mayor, um, uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, is is just an advocate of. Uh, making sure that the citizens of Atlanta remain safe, but she was equally, um, you know, just passionate about making sure that the staff um, was safe. So the uh, first things were identifying the critical functions that we had to continue even in with the city hall shutting down. And so um, the airport never really shut down. I mean, we've always maintained um, staff on prem. Um, and so we of course had to support them, but our frontline workers, our police department, our fire department, um, sanitation, those, those services that we continue to provide. Um, so we, we just from a remote, um, just trying to have all of the 10,000 employees for in, in, in um, uh, contractors that support the city, um, just we had a rapid um, laptop procurement and, 
and deployment because not all of our users had um, laptops. So that was the first in try, trying to get um, equipment in, um, get everything imaged, deployed, and, and, and still maintaining social distancing and all that. It was a huge logistics uh, nightmare within in itself. Um, we really had to revamp how we deliver uh, support. I mean, our um, 311 is the agency that, that handles all of the incoming calls for local residents. I mean, we had to revamp the way that they're structured. We are actually still in the process of completely digitizing that department. They have opted to never return back to the city. So we have, we're completely looking at their phone systems, how they take calls, the CRMs. Um, those became um, really, really big um, push. Um, the other is that the airport specifically all of the vendors, all of the concessionaires, um, the airlines and, and so forth that were taking in, you know, being hit by this um, pandemic, um, just their unique ways of trying to keep operations um, going. And so we of course had to support that. Then it shifted to, all right, we figured out how to maintain critical services. How do we keep all of the other services that we provide? And so we had to figure out how to reopen court virtually, how to um, all of the boards and the legal requirements from a legislative perspective, how to conduct all of those agency meetings um, remotely. And so we've had a lot of strategic partners that have kind of come into play to help us. One major win for us during this time um, everything was so manual in the city. Um, we have had a crash course in digitization um, and people trusting the process. And so I'm, I'm, I'm honored to help kind of guide that. Um, and then in the middle of all of this, we had the riots that um, happened here in Atlanta with some of the, the, um, the things that have been very public um, in terms of uh, policing and police transparency. So then everything shifted. Um, and so um, the mayor really wanted to have um, police of transparency, use of force, um, ways to um, have the communities interact with our police department. So we had some special projects that kind of um, bubbled up to the top. Um, and so we are, we are becoming a very lean and agile um, organization. And I've told the team that that's a great thing that we've been able to get it all done, but I do believe we've set a standard that it's gonna, we're gonna have to continue to operate this way. Interesting. And so, so when you look back into 2020, was there any technology or process or procedure? Was there anything that you had in place that really helped you, you know, deal with, uh, you know, all of the, all of the changes that were, were unanticipated? Was there something you can point to that says that was in place and wow, are we, are we happy it was? Sure. So two things. Um, we had already began our journey. Um, we, we have a strategic plan that we put together a couple of years ago. And so cloud first strategy was already um, there. And so we had already started to look at our cloud governance. We had made a decision um, to start a migration of one of our data centers um, that was already planned. Um, when this all happened, we had to rapidly change a course. And so now we have multiple um, implementations underway at the same time. But I think a lot of that groundwork that we had done already um, really prepared us for that. The other was um, virtual uh, VDI and virtual desktop. So we had already started to um, have pockets of that in the city. And so some of our critical functions that really, really um, are dependent on being on site to perform their jobs, we had to emulate their workspaces um, in this virtual um, capacity. And that was already underway. So we, everything was kind of already kind of happening, but we just had to turn it up a little bit and we're having to deploy a lot faster than we normally would have. Got it. And then kind of a related looking back question, um, knowing what you know now, what might you have done differently or so-called fifth quarter quarterbacking? What, you know, what would have been um, some things you, you, you may have uh, slightly changed in, you know, the March, April, May kind of time frame to, to have maybe a different outcome by, by the end of the year? So um, the one that I'm feeling the most right now is that we were embarking on an AD consolidation project and a migration to the cloud. Um, it was a project that we did a lot of research on, you know, team was just kind of discovery. We were in discovery longer than I probably care to be. Well, that project has turned into a logistics 
project now because in order to do this type of migration, you have to touch every single person, every single device. And so how do you do that and not be on-prem? Um, so we've had to be very strategic um, and thinking outside the box. And, and, it, and it, of course, this project was supposed to be done nine months ago and we're still in it. Um, so that would be one of them that I feel like if we had, we would be probably a lot further along in other areas if we had gotten that project um, kind of further down the ramp before COVID. Interesting, appreciate, appreciate the candor. Um, but there's always those big projects you wish you could have done a little bit differently, right? Um, you know, looking ahead, let's let's shift gears. 2021, 2022, um, and and I and I I, I say this um, with the utmost admiration. I Atlanta is pretty lucky to have you uh, going forward because you, you you know you've got this great understanding already. Being the CTO of of the airport, your CDC background, you understand you know diseases and you know, and then your Lockheed background brings this security aspect, and so. Gosh, I hope more Atlantans know, you know, they got the perfect person in the job to kind of figure out these pieces. How do you, uh, you know, how do you look at, uh, I didn't mean to say earlier, the airport shut down, but clearly it slowed down, you know, with international uh, 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 air travel. But how do you, you know, those pieces of the pandemic and security and cyber and, you know, what, what um, DHS, or, you know, could push down, how do those pieces kind of come together as you see, you know, traffic increasing probably, you know, over the summer months and into the autumn and, and uh, the, the back half of 2021. Sure. And I'll speak specifically to the airport. Um, we are lucky to have a, a great general manager commissioner of the airport. He keeps me on my toes. Um, he is not planning to lose his place as the top and first, you know, airport. So he wants it fast. He wants it lean. He wants to secure. Um, he's very um, invested in digitization. Um, he understands the needs to make sure that we are building a scalable and flexible infrastructure that will support 5G and all of the things that he wants to, to continue to, to push for the airport. So we're taking advantage of this time um, that things are slow and we're doing some very disruptive types of projects that will um, definitely set us ahead um, a lot you know, faster opposed to us having to figure out how to have these outages and periods, right? And so um, I commend him for that. And then um, needless to say, he's um, just as committed to security as I am. So that makes it easier, right? I'm not having to try to uh, coax or, you know, have to sell and champion it where sometimes I do. Um, he gets it. And when I say I'm going to do something, he holds me to it. And uh, so we have a, a wonderful relationship. Um, in terms of the rest of the city, I, again, I think they have been able, all of the leadership have had to sit back and reimagine themselves. We actually have a program that we call Reimagine City Hall, right? We've looked at all of the different business processes, how we issue business licenses, construction license, Apple Hala, you know, just everything. And so while we've had to stand up some things really quickly to continue to support business continuity, I think is shaping the way city Atlanta, the city of Atlanta will function moving forward. Um, and so that's going to be um, more agile systems. Um, it will also be a lot of transparency for our constituents. Um, data is going to be huge. Everyone wants to see the metrics and so forth. And so we will continue to expand and grow as that digital city. But at the same time, our mayor is very, you know, very committed to homelessness and digital equity. And so those projects are not lost in this, this timing. Um, a lot of our emergency funding have gone to those programs. And so we also uh, continue to support um, the social equity types of um, things and supporting education and digitiz digitizing education, all those things are kind of working in parallel to, with us delivering city services. I, I want to um, double click on that a little bit. It sounds like a very ambitious program um, and it's exciting to hear that I think you use the word doubling down, but you're really pushing hard on some things given that the, for instance, at the airport, the traffic uh, isn't, isn't as it was at this time last year. Were those projects, I'm curious, were those projects already funded and you're pushing forward with them or did you get the mayor and the commissioner for the airport and other budget holders to say, hey, now's the time to do this and you, and you found that money? Because it's, it's one thing if they're funded, it's another thing to say, hey, let's, let's use this time creatively and find some new budget 
and, and push harder on these topics and, and get ahead of the game. Um, yeah, a lot of our initiatives uh, right now, we'll say some of the projects at the airport are new, um, just wow. were not initially funded that we've had to encounter. And I'll tell you another area that a major and significant um, funding has gone into is our policing. And so, um, again, you know, uh, absent of hiring, just doubling our police force, the way we police and real time policing with eyes and visualizations into particular areas, those are other areas that the city has been committed to making investments in, and those are new projects for us. Right. So there's been clearly there's given the political environment, there's been policy changes and you have to follow that pretty quickly with some technology changes to support those policy changes. And um, those are those are obviously newly funded or re reprioritization of earlier budget yes. projects. Yes. Got it. And so how are you thinking about the people stuff, right? You've got hundreds of people that report to you. You don't see them as often. I mean, you're a big people person and you know, how do you, how do you, how do you move that forward? How do you, what are the techniques you're using to keep your people plugged in and making them feel engaged? And, you know, I read a statistic this morning, like 40% of IT workers are feeling, you know, unfulfilled right now and they're not getting enough, uh, they think credit for what they're doing. It was a data point I saw today. What what's really what are you doing in that domain and, and keeping your teams uh, plugged in? So um, being very intentional about it, right? Um, so I feel like um, I am I've always been kind of a approachable, touchable type of person on site, and we've been just working hard to figure out how do we maintain that. So I have several different uh, uh, meetings that I am actually engaged in myself. I don't want to be this far removed person where the staff has access to me. Um, so we have um, standing meetings with all of the leadership across the city where we come together and we're strategic and talk about what's happening and how we can support each other. You know, we might, this may be my primary focus, but when we have a huge initiative then we need all um, personnel on deck, um, we are really working on that collaboration and making sure we're moving in the same area. Um, I will tell you, Mr. Brantley was intentional about this as well. We started a lot of um, employee engagement surveys and things of that nature prior to COVID just to really understand how do we engage our staff a little bit more. And one of the things we heard from them was training, uh, wanting to be able to work remotely, which we can do this now, um, but then also wanting to make sure that they understood what's happening. Like a lot of times they felt like I know my piece, but I don't know everything, right? And so we are being very intentional about that communication, making sure we have very uh, uh, transparent goals and, and, and we're then measuring ourselves against it. And I, I'll tell you, one of the things that I feel like the staff has embraced a lot is the accountability. They, they like to be held accountable. They wanna be given credit when, it's, when they do a great job. And I make sure that we hear them. We plug them out on social media. We, we do whatever we can to make them know. We, we see them and we appreciate them. And then we try to make sure people know to get up, go outside. If you can take a meeting and walk around your block, go outside and take your meetings and things of that nature. So we're also wanting to make sure that we take care of each other and, and we you know look out for, for um, a balance, making sure we have a balance. That's that's uh, that's wonderful. And a little bit more on that. You said uh, prior to COVID, employee surveys were suggesting that uh, that people wanted, you know, more remote work. Um, are you shifting more? Do you anticipate more longer term a hybrid model and people only coming in a couple of days a week? And therefore, you know, how do you how are you planning on making permanent those types of shifts and is that going to require some new programs or some new initiatives or activities? How is, how is the city of Atlanta, from an IT perspective, holding that problem and indeed for the 10,000 employees and contractors, not just IT? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, we've looked at, um, we have a plan, our return to work plan um, that one allows us to continue to social distance, but also making sure that we have minimal critical staff. And what that'll look like is um, we'll have some staff that'll um, need to be on site, our techs and things that support users. Um, but our help desk has grown a lot, right? Um, because we have more intern calls coming in. Um, and then the other departments, I, I see us having some level of rotation where we have some minimal staff on site, but we are able to do that in a rotational basis so that folks can continue to um, have a little bit more flexibility. So absolutely something that we're looking to do long-term. And I think it's a, it's a, um, 
it is actually a goal of, across the city. So all of our agencies are looking at the same thing. It's it, maybe it's an observation. Um, it is it is an observation. Maybe you could comment on, and that is, you know, how does that informal stuff get done in this hybrid world or even remote, like the the serendipitous meeting you have, right? You bump into somebody getting a coffee, or you can grab a quick lunch with them, and you know, just the randomness of connecting with your colleagues. Um, have you given any thought of how to mimic that, you know, or how to uh, in a in a hybrid world, because that's so yeah, important you know, to work. Yeah, we weren't a big chat type of organization before. Um, I do see that increasing a lot, uh, and to have the phone ring and it's a Teams call, somebody just randomly calling you, those types of drive bys, those are happening. But um, right. we're also doing some of the gathering that are that's not work. We've had several of our after hours. Um, you know, team building um, type of functions that are all over Zoom, but we've hired DJs, we've had the teams, you know, connecting, you see the families and kids in the background. And um, it's just been amazing. Um, and the, a lot of the leaders on the team have been a lot vulnerable. So team, the team members can see them outside of their normal capacity and all of those things just continue to help us um, be con you know, close knit and, and supportive. And we've had some illnesses and we've had team members lose um, family members and, and we continue to rally around them in during this time as well. Interesting, that, that, that's great, thank you. Uh, last question I wanna end on, um, we talked about this the other day, the nugget, you know, the nugget. What, what's the one thing that you think uh, other CIOs, other digital leaders should know, other CTOs, that you've kind of worked and, and progressed in your own career that maybe it's a trick of the trade that, that maybe they don't know or they haven't really thought about. But what's, what, I think what's the one thing that you kind of keep in your toolkit that when, you know, when times get tough, you really need a breakthrough, you know, you got a team issue, you pull out and it works like a charm. Is there, is there something that, that maybe you have uh, developed that, that that other CIOs or digital leaders could uh, could learn from in that regard. Could be technology or people or culture or process anything really. Sure, um, I think my nugget would be um, regardless of I've had the opportunity to work in different uh, verticals and different um, in different capacities, and I make it a point to know the function that I'm supporting. I, I, I know it inside and out. I try to know their problems. I try to learn a little history about it. And it's been very interesting with the city of Atlanta. So I had to learn airport stuff, had to, which I kind of connect with Lockheed and planes and so forth. I had to understand uh, policing, fire, the water side. And so I, I do a lot of homework and I do a lot of studying. And I think that that conversation then becomes what's important to you as a business leader how can I help and support you? And it doesn't become way, way techie. They leave the techie stuff to me, but they know that I'm um, solutioning on their behalf. And it's always a way to connect. At the end of the day, if, if it's a priority for you, it's a priority for me. And uh, we find a way to connect there. One of, so not delegate, but just get in there and really, really know the, the business and the stuff you support. My team will tell you, I, I'll get in there and they know I'm, I'm digging. So I, I, I that's one thing I don't want to lose is being a technologist and understanding, um, you know, the different um, options that we have and what we could be doing. And so I, I try to get my hands dirty a little bit. They, they don't like it, but I do. <laughs> Ty, that's, that's wonderful. I know we're running out of time. Um, and by the way, I want to thank you. You've uh, recently joined our advisory board here in the U.S. So I really look forward to working with you in the, in the months and years ahead. Um, so thank you very much on behalf of CIONet. Just uh, 30 seconds to, to wrap this up. Uh, next week, we have Dave Barry. Dave's the serial CIO, uh, both in Europe and in the US. He spent more than a decade in Europe with leading brands. Uh, and on deck, we have executives from Coca-Cola, Bank of America, Bank of the West, TrackPhone, TIAA Bank, Knoll, Campbell Soup, and, and many others. So long list of uh, digital leaders coming up. Join us every Wednesday, noon Eastern, 6 p.m. CET. And uh, it's midweek, folks. Have a, have a good rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the last 15 years, I've been on a quest to discover the DNA of the most successful digital leaders in the world. What makes them tick, what's in their minds and in their hearts. 
We are sharing deep insights from our world-class CIOs so that you get inspired, can learn and reach your full potential as a digital leader. If you are an ambitious technology executive, then I invite you to join CIO.net. Join our community so that you too can realize your ambition.